the same ability, but it can be used for good or for bad. So we're going to look at the bad side of HTML5 as well. And in the last section, we'll come to that a little bit later on. So, as I said, there's a lot of cool new features in HTML5, but I'm going to pick the five, first of all, that I think are going to make the biggest difference on the web. The first of those is um, graphics libraries. So there's two new types of graphic libraries available in HTML5. Uh, the first one is for 2D graphic animation, it's called Canvas. And the second one is for 3D graphic generation, and that's called WebGL. So to show you kind of what they do, um, so using Canvas, if I run the following code, uh, or the following HTML in uh, browser, as you see there, it's fairly simple and straightforward. You run that and the browser will render it as a red rectangle with a blue ball in front of it. Okay, and of course you can move these objects around and do all sorts of things, right? So it's very easy to use, but at the end of the day, having a couple of blue balls on the screen isn't going to change the world anytime soon. So let's look at some cooler stuff that you can do with Canvas. Um, a lot of people upload photographs to the web on a regular basis and they like sending them to their friends, interacting with those photos and so on. So here's a nice little demo that I have here just to show kind of cooler things you can do in Canvas. So we have some pictures here, we've got the Trend Micro who I work for their logo, I can drag them around, I can do things like resize them, you know, make them bigger, show corners, make them look like Polaroid pictures, all this sort of like easy dragon animation and it's, it's nice and easy to, to make use of, right? So that already makes sites more interactive and easy to use and none of this is making use of Flash which you'd normally traditionally have had to use to, to do this sort of stuff. Um, some engineers from Google decided to really put the graphic libraries in HTML5 to the test. Um, so they came up with a port of Quake. Hands up here who's played Quake, the original one, right? Most people. Quake was, for me, I remember the, the first time I've ever upgraded a computer purely to play a computer game, because my old computer was so crap I couldn't run it properly. Um, I also remember when we were back in college that we'd often go to the, the computer labs that had Quake installed on them and um, if there was only one seat left in the lab, one guy would sit down, we knew all the IP addresses so we'd send a ping of death packet to four machines in a row, blue screen them and then the people would get up and leave having lost their work and we'd sit down and play Quake. Um, probably not the most ethical thing to do but, you know, we were students. Uh, so anyway. What Google have done is they ported the whole thing across. I have a nice video here, so you can see it running. It's actually Quake 2 that they ported it across. Um, as you can see here, all of this is actually running in the browser. So this is a recorded video of it, but I've downloaded it and played it myself, and it works quite well. You can see it. This is a browser. Right? Um, the graphics in this are a mixture of the kind of 3D graphics, the WebGL stuff, and then all those textures on the side of boxes and the walls, the wee bit dark on the screen there, are using the Canvas library. It also has all of the audio from the original game, so if you don't believe me, it sounds like this. Right, that's exactly what Quake sounds like. Um, it's using web sockets, which give you real-time bi-directional network communication. Um, so it's none of this Ajax style polling that you would have had to do in the past, it's like a real socket. Um, you can good frame rates, you can store everything in the local storage for a kind of save game type of uh, thing. And as you can see, this is, you know, it plays exactly like you would expect Quake to, to play. So it really shows off just what you can do with these new graphic libraries. And just like in normal Quake, some guy comes up behind you and frags you uh, when you're not looking. So regardless of whether you're a fan of computer games, I think you can kind of see already the potential for using these libraries to do all sorts of awesome stuff. Possibly next-gen consoles will actually be little more than just a web browser and all of the actual heavy lifting for the, the processing and the graphics can be done on the server side and piped down to you. Um, so that's the first feature of HTML5 that I think is going to make a difference, these type of graphics libraries. You will also, if you're kind of paying attention, you might notice I've sneaked in the second feature already and that's how easy it is to embed video and audio on web pages now with HTML5. So in the past, if you had to embed a video, you normally either upload it to YouTube and link it in that way, or you had to use a whole bunch of object tags and you know embed and flash and that sort of stuff, which kind of feels clunky because so much of what we do on the internet is watch videos or listen to audio, and it should just be a hell of a lot easier to do than that. So now, thankfully, it is. 
there's a new video tag. Simply give it the, the movie you want to play, and of course you can interact with the movie now properly because it's part of the actual DOM. It's a lot easier to control. So to give an example, the same movie we had earlier on, um, I can play it with a button from outside. I can do things like add CSS reflections to it. You can move it around, manipulate it any way you want. It's a hell of a lot nicer to use than the old Flash stuff in the past. This is the reason, incidentally, why you see Adobe investing very heavily in HTML5 stuff, because they know Flash is as good as dead as a result of this stuff. So I'm just going to pause that. So that's video and audio. Um, the next thing is that nowadays when we use the internet, we are more and more using it in the mobile way. So you're not so much using, you're rarely using a desktop anymore. Um, Laptops, fair enough, but a lot of times it's going to be an iPad or Android phone or something like that. So you're going to be on the move. And on the move means that geolocation comes in very nicely. So you can, with the simple two lines of JavaScript, you can get some of these IP coordinates. Um, it's very, very simple to do. So just to show a demo here, so that looks pretty accurate. So it says I'm within 45 meters of there. Uh, if I was doing this on my phone, it's going to be even more accurate because it's, this is just using GeoIP. But if I was using my phone, it's going to actually use the, the GPS on the phone. And of course, you can also use it to actually track movement. So it's not just a one-time thing. As the person moves around, you can track their movement. Um, that leads to a whole bunch of new possible uses. Uh, advertising can make use of this. So if you're walking down the street and you're checking a news site that has an ad, you might get an ad to the McDonald's 500 meters away because they know where you are, so they can serve you very targeted advertising. Um, I've seen a cool kind of proof of concept uh, version of Pac-Man that uses HTML5 and geolocation. And the idea is everybody gets an iPad or other tablet. They log on to the site. One person is Pac-Man. The actual graph or, or the, like the game is played in the streets of New York. So Pac-Man is walking around with you know iPad collecting these collecting the pills that Pac-Man eats, and you've got a bunch of other people who are the ghosts and they're trying to find them. Um, now that sounds like a lot of fun until you you know think about the chance of people getting horribly maimed and killed while walking across the road with an iPad like this and not paying attention to the truck coming at them. Um, luckily, I guess in New York the traffic is just completely gridlocked anyhow, so nothing's actually moving. But uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with using geolocation. Fourth feature is drag and drop. So drag and drop is very simple. You can drag content from the, the uh, internet to your machine, and you can drag content from your machine to the internet. Not even particularly revolutionary, but what it does is it kind of blurs the line between where your you where the web stops and where your machine starts. It feels a lot more like it's part of the operating system. So to give an example, it's working, and this is it feels a lot nicer than kind of old you know right click save as to, to download something. So if I want to download something here, I'm just gonna minimize that. So I just download this PDF for example. I can just grab it, drag it, drop it and it's on the desktop. That feels to me at least a hell of a lot nicer than you know, save as, file download and all that sort of stuff. Uploading things, and here's just a couple of people, some Twitter icons for people speaking at the con, so I can just drag them in, drop them, and they're in the site and I can interact with them straight away. So if you think about what that means for a site like uh, Facebook, so you come back from your holidays or you come back from this con, you want to upload your photos, instead of having to go through like an upload form, you just get them, toss them onto the browser, and they're instantly on Facebook or whatever social network you use, and you can then share them with your friends. And it just feels a hell of a lot more natural to do. Um, obviously, this doesn't work so well on a tablet in the kind of world where you have apps, but for actual desktops and laptops, it works very nicely. So, those are four of the features. Um, you might notice as well that actually this entire presentation is actually written in HTML5 and JavaScript. So I'm not using PowerPoint here, this is just a site. Um, so actually if you find my talk particularly boring, you can just go to that site and just skip ahead and see what I'm going to talk about. Um, please don't feed off the site because this presentation will end fairly you know, quickly. Um, so we've talked about Canvas Library, we talked about geolocation, drag and drop, and how easy it is to do video. The, the last feature I wanted to show you, which I think is quite nice, is something called web notifications. So web notifications are little pop-ups that look like this. 
So they just pop up, they're actually outside the browser. So if I minimize this, you can see it actually pops outside the browser. So again, it kind of feels more natural, feels more part of the operating system than part of the web browser. Um, everything in that little web notification is just HTML. So you can control the look and feel of it any way you want. Of course, that means you could use it for nasty things. Um, an example would be, for example, a really evil use of it would be Microsoft's online version of Office could bring back this little guy, the annoying pepper tip. Um, but obviously you can use it for good things like it uh, would be perfect for Facebook um, wall post updates or Twitter updates or you know, you've got new email, that type of thing. Um, so it is a kind of nice feature. So what we'll talk about now is the, the bad side of HTML5. Um, a lot of the new attacks in HTML5, they're kind of best explained by showing you code and stepping through line by line. That unfortunately makes for a pretty horrible, crappy presentation. Um, there's no fun for anybody. So instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bunch of different attacks, put them together into an actual real attack uh, kind of that could happen, you know, like an actual profile of an attack, and we can kind of step through and see how an attacker could make use of some of these attacks. If you want to see the low level of how you can do it yourself, then you can read my paper or I've got links at the end to other people's work as well. So, in this scenario, we're going to have an attacker. Uh, you know he's a hacker because he has one of those. Um, every hacker, they, they have to have an anonymous mask, otherwise they're not a hacker, right? This is how the police can identify you. So if they go to your house and you own one of them, you're a hacker. I own one, but you know. Um, so, in this case, we're going to imagine we've got a hacker, he's trying to break into a company. Um, for my scenario, I've called the company Bravo Limited, but just whatever you want to think of. What he wants to do is he wants to break in, he wants to map the entire network to see what's there, take over as many machines as possible, steal as much data as possible, and then disappear without leaving any traces. Right? So the first thing our attacker will do in this scenario is do some recon. He's going to go to social networks like LinkedIn, Facebook, and so on. I seem to be mentioning Facebook a lot, which sounds like I'm plugging them, but anyway. Um, so um, from, the, from this type of recon, you can already get an idea of what sort of operating systems are running on the network. So you will often see you know, some guy working at the company on LinkedIn in his profile that says he's an expert in Unix or whatever else. So from this, he figures out that the actual company is running quite a varied amount of operating systems. They have a fair bit of Windows, but they also have a lot of people using Mac. They have a lot of the executives are mostly just using iPads or Android devices, iPhones, that sort of thing. So he decides to pick um, JavaScript as the one language that he knows is going to run across absolutely everything in the, in the company. Also, when he's doing his recon, he finds that some of the employees at the company, about 10 employees or so, have their own kind of vintage car club. They get together every weekend, they, they make up, you know, they tweak their own car, old cars and so on. And they also spend a lot of time on a certain vintage car forum during the day. So, in his profiling of the, the Bravo network, he's found that actually most of their sites, the Bravo sites, are pretty locked down. So their InfoSec team have done a good job, he's not going to get to exploit them anytime soon. But this forum that these guys go to every day is pretty much it's open to attack. So he's going to use that as the initial attack vector. So in my scenario, there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability on this site. Uh, he tests the cross-site scripting vulnerability the way everybody tests cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which is an alert box, right? That's how we know we can run JavaScript code. Um, obviously, he wants to do a lot more than just actually do that, but we'll get to that in a second. So, even if this site has taken some steps to prevent cross-site scripting, there's new stuff in HTML5 that might get around that. So, one of the most common ways to prevent cross-site scripting, and it's not a good way to do it, but it's one of the most common ways to see implemented, is essentially blacklisting. So, you're not allowed to put the word script in anywhere, you're not allowed to put like image source or anything else like that. Not a good, not, I wouldn't recommend that to protect your site, but that's how a lot of people are actually doing it. So, and if sites are doing that and aren't aware that there's a whole bunch of new tags and attributes that you can use from HTML5, then those blacklists are essentially out of date. So to give some examples, um, some of them are based on new tags. Uh, all of these you'll find on HTML5sec.org 
as well. So the video tag can contain JavaScript and on error. So if you're not filtering for video tags, you're only filtering for scripts or something else, then this will get through and you can run it. Some of the new XSS is based on new attributes. So for example, the autofocus, which just gives focus to uh, an input field or anything else. So in this case, you set on focus to run JavaScript, and then you use autofocus to apply focus to it. Uh, another one that I, I like a lot is this one, using on scroll. So you put an input field down the very, very bottom of the page, and you say you set it so that when the actual page scrolls, it's going to actually call your JavaScript, and then you just bring focus to the bottom of the page, page scrolls, executes your JavaScript. So if the, guy, if the site doesn't have defenses for these in place, or it's not using something like actual whitelisting, which it should be, then these are going to work. But of course, the attacker doesn't want to just run a pop-up box on this site. It wants to run an actual fully-fledged attack kit. Um, in our scenario, this guy's lazy, so he doesn't want to have to write one himself. Uh, luckily for him, there's a bunch of different kind of shells and stuff online. One of the first uh, that came out was from a company called Attack and Defense Labs, uh, andlabs.org, which is basically two researchers from India. And they use two of the new features of HTML5, uh, web sockets and cross-origin requests, to set up essentially, it's entirely JavaScript, but it's a shell that will run in the victim's browser and let the attackers surf the web through their browser as if they were at the actual machine. So if the, you know you can use that, you can go to the victim's internal webmail, that sort of thing. And it should also send all the cookies that he, his browser would send. Since that's come out, there's a bunch of other um, shells using cross-origin requests. Uh, Beef does some fantastic stuff with it. Actually, how many people here have used Beef? Right? Ah, excellent. Yeah, so I'm going to plug Beef a little bit later on as well, because I think it's awesome. Um, so he's going to take a, a toolkit like this, load that into the cross-site scripting, and then those 10 people who go to that vintage car forum are going to be essentially under his control. So you can send a single command, and all 10 of those will execute it for him. So how do these toolkits work? They, they make use, um, in at least some cases, of a new feature in XML HTTP requests. So everyone here know what XML HTTP requests does? Just send a HTTP request, right? Nothing particularly magic. Um, in the past, before HTML5, it was restricted by the same origin policy. So site A can send an HTTP request to site A, but it can't send it to site B. Um, in their infinite wisdom, they decided that people would maybe sometimes want to request details from other sites, so they've changed this. So now site A can request content from another site, from another domain, site B, and as long as site B replies with a header that is, says access control allow origin, then it can read the response. So, for example, if I have a site and I want to get my Twitter feed in, and Twitter is allowing me to, to it's going to return the center back to me, I can make the request in JavaScript, get the Twitter feed, put it onto my site, and it'll all work quite nicely. There's a couple of downsides to that. Um, there are a few new attacks. The first one is quite simple, which is only reading the response is restricted. You can still send requests. So if you can already do damage just by sending the actual HTTP request, then this is perfect. So if you had a site that was something like this, some gambling site where you can bet on horses, you know, if you just send that request, you, you won't be able to re read the response, but it's still going to work perfectly fine in, in JavaScript. Um, you can also, using WebSockets and XML HTTP requests, connect not only to a domain or a site, but to a specific port, if you want to. And um, one of the, the cool things about this is that, based on the timing of how long it takes that port to reply back, you can actually figure out if the port is open or closed. It's not as good as you know a port scanner like something like Nmap would be, but considering it's all running in the browser, it's all web traffic, it's pretty stealthy, it's actually a very nice little feature. So our attacker has gained control of those 10 machines. He now wants to map the whole network, so he's going to use this port scanning trick, just using WebSockets and XML HTTP request, and he uses that and he starts scanning the whole network. Um, when he does that, he finds a whole bunch of interesting machines, he gets where reports are open on them. 
he notices, in this case, that one of the machines is an internal web server, um, and he can browse to it as well using Shell in the future. And like many other companies, actually, how many companies here have like an internal or like myhome.company.com, right? Most like where you know the CEO tells you how wonderful the company is doing and all that sort of stuff, right? That's the default home page for most people when they log on. So if you can get access to that, and even though the InfoSec team generally do a pretty good job of guarding all the external sites, uh, at least in companies that I've looked at, some of the internal sites are pretty old or using old versions of WordPress or God knows what else. So based on that, you can upload the same cross-site scripting, hopefully to this, this internal domain. And then what happens the next day when everybody comes into the office, they connect to their, they turn on the browser, they open it up to the default home page, and everybody now is under his control. Um, the downside, this actually kind of gets around one of the, the big downsides of these browser-based type of botnets, which is they are very stealthy, because they're all coming across web traffic, but they're also very easy to remediate. All you need to do to clean this up is basically tell everybody to close their browser, and the whole thing goes poof. Or even close the tab in a lot of cases will, will work. Um, so when you're doing these type of attacks, the attacker needs to have these kind of reinfection points where people are going to come back to them over again and get reinfected and, and start the whole process. It also means that for attackers using these botnets, they're going to use need to have different business models than traditional botnets. So these are well suited for um, types of business models where you don't need the clients to be online the entire time. So for denial of service, uh, Bitcoin mining, that type of thing, where if the machine goes offline, so what, and just using the computational resources for a while, it works particularly well. So at this stage, the attacker now has a pretty thorough map of the whole network. Uh, he's taken over most of the machines. He can even go one step further and be a bit nice and actually go and geolocate all of those various machines as well. So he knows not only what IP or sorry, what IP they have, what ports are open, but he actually knows where in the world those servers are located. Um, doing this as well, you can do some pretty cool things. You can see that the CEO, for example, is at Starbucks but has left her laptop behind. Because the CEO's laptop is reporting it in the office. But the CEO's iPhone, which is in his pocket, says he's down the road at Starbucks. So you can actually, especially with mobile devices, you can start tracking individual employees just by turning on the geolocation. It, it is nice enough geolocation that it does ask your permission to be allowed to track it. But I think everybody in this room knows that if you do a pop-up to a user that says, do you want to do something, they always make the wrong choice. That's even before you add social engineering on top of this. Um, so again, very thorough kind of mapping of off the network. So next thing he wants to do, obviously, is to exfiltrate data from the network. Um, he can do a bunch of things here. He can use more kind of traditional methods by just browsing through these, these phones or browsing through the compromised machines to internal web resources like webmail pages or internal uh, iShares or wikis and start pulling, pulling data out that way. But I'm going to show some new stuff that you can do in HTML5 instead that makes his life a little bit easier. Uh, one is a kind of upgraded version of an attack on autocomplete. So everybody's familiar with autocomplete, right? The little drop down that tells you, you know, what you've entered in the past. Um, that drop down is not accessible normally in the DOM, right? It's, it's the browser puts it there for you, but it's not easy to get access to. Um, using a little bit of social engineering, you can now basically get people, especially if you get them to play a game or something where they have to click constantly, then you can actually start filling or going through and mining each of these fields. So the attacker can create a field that's essentially hidden to the user with, let's say, name as the ID, and then start pulling all the stuff that's ever been in for name, the email, credit card, or whatever else he wants to come up with. It takes a while to get them, but it's kind of hidden in the background and works pretty well. Um, for social engineering, those little web notifications are absolutely excellent. Um, so you can do stuff like this. You've been logged out of Gmail, please put your password in to, to um, you know, log in. Uh, this does work. I know for a fact it works because I've tested it on my family. Um, my family get hacked on a routine basis. Anytime I'm working on a new projects, normally my sister is the first person to be hacked by it. Uh, so she fell for this. 
Um, she also fell for, um, I made it to look like an Active Directory logout thing as well. She fell for that. And I even changed it to look like something for Mac. And she doesn't use Mac, but she still fell for it. So this tells us one of two things. Either social engineering like this works particularly well, or my sister isn't the brightest person in the world, right? But she has a PhD, so she knows, well, she knows stuff about water and chemicals, but uh, not so much about social engineering and hacking. Um, so this works really well. You're, you're pretty much only limited here by your imagination, what you can come up with. And remember, the web notifications feel much more like part of the operating system. So even if the browser is minimized, these things are going to pop up, and then it just feels more like it's the OS talking to them. They do always, at least on Chrome, in the kind of top corner, you'll see the actual site that it's sending this to, but most people don't notice it. And it's in Chrome, it's actually intentionally made to look small, and kind of you just don't notice it. Other stuff you can do, you can even actually potentially record voice. So now there's voice um, active, or like voice activation or any input field, you can take somebody's voice. Um, it will always show this little speak now thing, so you know that your voice has been recorded. That's part of the spec says that you have to know that your voice has been recorded. Um, I haven't figured out a way personally, but to like overlay that with some CSS or something so that you you don't see that. I'm not saying it's not possible to do, I'm just I'm not the greatest programmer in the world, so if somebody else can do that, great. Um, and if you do this, Google are going to be nice enough to type it all up for you. So what actually happens in, in Chrome is your voice gets recorded, gets sent to Google servers, they go through it to do um, voice recognition, and then they fill the input field with the actual text that you send. So you don't have to do any of that, Google's going to do all that for you. Um, so using these, he can already exfiltrate a lot of useful and interesting information. Another demo I wanted to show, I don't know, is this Christoph Drew? No, or is he already getting ready for his next talk? So this is uh, Christoph, who's going to do the Chrome extension <coughs> stuff, came up with this attack, it's called Filejacking. Really nice idea. So he's got a, a demo page over here, um, which is just social engineering you into filling out a form, and it's then going to download the results of the survey for you. If we look at the little download button, and just go to inspect element here. You can see it's actually uh, overlaid with an input type of directory. So directory is a new input type for HTML5. So in the past you could upload files to the web. Now you can upload an entire directory. The problem is most users aren't actually familiar with this concept yet, that you can actually upload a directory. So if you just change the button to say it's a download, that say you can where do you want to download the file to? The user then browses and says, hey, I'll download it to my desktop or to my, you know, my documents slash top secret folder. And you're giving them access to that folder instead of actually downloading something. So to show it working, just download two. Um, I'm gonna just put it into, let's see, my uh, work folder. Or sorry, into the folder for this actual talk. Because I am going to be giving access to this to Christoph and I don't trust him. So work, second here, so this is where, I'm, it looks like this is where I'm saving the thing to, but this is actually what I'm giving access to, right? So h 5 I have far too many folder structures in this building. Uh, slides, second here, see, group up, right. So it looks now like it's saving to that folder. Um, if you scroll down here, there's a, a little kind of a, we're preparing your file for upload so that the actual, or for download, so the user thinks that this is going on. If I go to the back end here and refresh clients, I can now see that my client shows up. When I click on it, here's all the files in that folder, which I can now download and request. So let us go grab one of these images. Uh, this one. So I just request it. My, my browser is now essentially working as a file server, giving the attacker full control of everything in that folder. So refresh the files again, see it's now available for download, and that's been pulled off my machine onto the web. Of course, you could, you could just script this, so instead of me having to manually go in, it just pulls the entire folder off the machine. So a little bit of social engineering and that, and you can start pulling entire directories off the people's machine. So, I'm back. 
So we've talked about the good side and the bad side of HTML5. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, I'm kind of, kind of cheated, but I want to talk about the, what to me is the really ugly, really bad side of HTML5. And um, I've cheated a bit because I've actually mentioned this already, but I'm going to talk about a term called BitBee, because um, everything now needs to have a cool acronym, like APT, right? It's not a good buzzword unless you can make a nice acronym out of it. BitBee stands for botnets in the browser. So for the first time properly, now with HTML5, you can write a proper botnet running entirely in somebody's browser. Um, it's memory resident. It's also a real pain for traditional security to deal with. So, and because it's running entirely in memory, antivirus scanners are not going to pick this up, or most likely not going to pick it up. Um, it's all web traffic, so firewalls are going to let it straight through. And because it's JavaScript, we all know how easy it is to obfuscate the hell out of that, so IDS are going to have a hard time as well. And that means that for the first time with one piece of code, an attacker can run a botnet on any device, on any operating system, in any location on the planet. Doesn't matter if you're using an iPad, Linux, Windows, as long as you have an up-to-date browser, this is going to work on it. So, uh, as part of the, the, the research paper, I came up with a kind of proof of concept, just so that I could see would it work. Let's show a demo of that here. So, I just added a few simple features in to my proof of concept. One's a DDoS, actually, it's a DOS, because there's not multiple of us here, but if loads of us did it, it would be a DDoS. Um, in this case, the uh, server and the client are both on the same machine, but obviously you can have them on separate machines. So just to show it's working, let's start the, the DDoS. I'm just going to launch an attack against uh, this, which is just a VM that I have running on the machine. So, start sending. And this is just sending over and over again. It's going to send a uh, request using XML HTTP requests. And actually, it's coming up particularly low for some reason. So, that wasn't particularly impressive, right? Um, so let me stop that. Sometimes that freaking doesn't work for some reason. But normally when I test this, I can get about 250 packets per second um, out of it, which I've tested is just slightly faster than low orbital ion cannon from Anonymous. And it's also really easy to script this up. It's just a web worker, which is a new, again, a new feature of HTML5. Um, it's essentially a background thread that will run, and it's just making requests over and over and over and over again. So 250 packets per second isn't that big of a deal, but if you have 10,000 machines doing it, and they're hitting like a search page or something resource intensive, then it's going to take the site down very quickly. Um, we can do some spam. In this case, I'm using, luckily nobody was smoking enough crack to think that sending uh, email directly from JavaScript should be allowed to happen. So what I'm using here is a kind of open spam relay, and uh, you know those like old you know, contact us pages on uh, websites? If you look at some of them out there, it's particularly the older ones, there's a hidden form field which just says the email that you're going to send it to. So you just change it, you do a get request, you overwrite that with whatever email you want to spam, and then you can use JavaScript to send spam. So just to start, I'm going to start spend, sending spam to a Gmail address, Give it a little bit of time. I'm just going to stop it now because I don't want Gmail to get too annoyed with me. When we go in here, you can see I just have a unique number based on the timestamp for each one. But we can start sending email and sending spam to people. So spam and DDoS both work. Uh, you can obviously get the host information. So I click that, you should see the uh, host information appears down here. It's Chrome 14, shows, my, um, shows where I am in the world at the moment, which is Belgium. I can do the little social engineering thing that I showed before. So this pop-up, or whatever other pop-up that you, you feel like doing. And because this is obviously a zombie, it has to have the ability to eat brains, so... Now imagine that playing on 10,000 people's iPhones as they're walking around and they didn't realize they're infected. That sounds like all fun to me. Um, also, when I, when I was doing this first, beef was only kind of coming out, so I've added beef in here. If you're unfamiliar with beef, actually, who, who said they were, has never seen beef used before, right? Nobody, right? But just to um, show some of the stuff that you can do with beef in here, because beef is really taking um, a lot of the stuff that I talked about that was kind of new at the time, it's all integrated into beef now at the moment. So if you're going to do a browser-based botnet, beef is definitely the, the right tool for it. 
So taking a little while to open this up. This is just running back home. So one second here. Okay. This is the problem with live demos, right? What's that? Hopefully, this is going to open up for me. And no, so unfortunately, as part of the demo, doesn't want to load up. But using Beef, you can um, a lot of the attacks I talked about earlier on. The, um, for example, the network scanning, um, all of these, like the, the web notification prompts, and a bunch of other social engineering uh, tricks are all built in there. There's a horde of stuff built into Beef, so if you haven't used it, I highly recommend you go have a look at it. Taking its time, you can see um, this is interesting. So one of these is my presentation, and the other two are people who have willingly volunteered to let me do bad things to their machine, right? Because they're following my presentation. Um, so to show that it's actually working, I think to best of my knowledge, Beef now no longer uses AJAX polling, it uses web sockets, right, for communication. So it should be kind of real time. Um, Roger, just to show it's actually working, create an alert, say hi from Brooklyn. It's cute, and hopefully if this is working, and if I actually haven't just sent that to somebody in the audience, it should be my IP, this should pop up, right? So you can see we can exchange information between the two. Um, other cool stuff that you can do um, with this, you can do the scanning. Like I mentioned, so we've got a network, just do a simple port scanner. I'm going to scan my, again, just that VM that I have open. 128. And instead of scanning all the ports, I'm just going to pick a few. 79, And you can see here, you can also set the, the timing for you know when you when consider something to be open or closed. Click Execute. And it should be starting running. So it says starting scanning those ports. So it's not going to be as fast as Inman, but this is a hell of a lot stealthier and it's all running entirely in the browser. So it's already going back, I think port 78 is open, which it isn't, not 100% accurate either. That's actually most likely because um, I'm tired of doing this against something that's running on the same host. So those timing signals are a bit off, you need to tweak it. But if you're running this across a network, it's a lot more accurate. Uh, just talking about the social engineering side of stuff. See, we have Pretty Tef, which I'm a big fan of. So again, the social engineer, somebody has something. You can send them pop-up, which is going to, or uh, kind of, you are what you call a pop under It's going to show up here and ask me to re-authenticate and log into something. You see your session is timed out. Test. And send that back. And social engineer the answer, so it says test, and my password, which I wrote in tech off. And of course you can do really evil stuff with Beef, but the most evil of all of these plugins is uh, where you can redirect your browser to things. So if you want to be particularly evil, you can go ahead, redirect the browser to a site of your choice, like this one. And uh, Rickroll people, uh, you're all very lucky in that I actually am um, well on time, so we can actually sit here and watch all three minutes and 33 seconds of this as you. So let's not do that. Okay, so in summary, we talked about the, the good side of HTML5, and there's a bunch of extra cool stuff that really is going to make the web a more interesting place. We've talked also about the bad side of HTML5. And we've talked about how you can now pretty easily build these kind of botnets in the browser. Um, as I said, I'm easily the worst coder in this entire room. It took me a weekend to put this stuff together. So if I can do it, I guarantee everybody in this room can do a better job than I can. Um, if you are interested in HTML5 security topics, a very good site is html5security.org. They have links to uh, the paper I wrote and a whole bunch of
bunch of other uh, tanks that have come out, also to blogs and videos and presentations, so one-stop shop to find out anything you want. Um, I also still tweet about this topic a bit on, on my Twitter feed, although I haven't looked into it in as much detail as anymore, and just because I have to get a plug-in for my employer summer, so because they actually sent me to the con, I put that in the end. So, I think that there is a lot of bad uses that you can put HTML5 to, but for me personally, I'm optimistic and I'm really looking forward to see what people do in terms of good uses and what's going to happen with the web as a result of all this. So, that's it for me. Um, any questions? Any questions? No? Okay, sweet. Thanks very much, folks. I'm going to go and finish my hangover. Thanks.